Um, I'm just going to hit record here a second. The, the reason I wanted to speak to you is because a few years ago, I, I got hold of your book, The Untold Story of Champ. Uh, this was after my, my visit to the lake. And I was just really fascinated by this um, no holds barred, you know, um, bare all out on the table view that you presented. <clears throat> and I thought, this is amazing. Normally, cryptozoological writers, they, they don't do this. You know, they don't say this is actually what it's like boots on the ground in the, in the right. location. Yeah. These are the trials and tribulations that people go through. So I thought I'd just get to sort of know a bit about you, why you wrote the book, and and a bit of background, you know, on on the history of this creature and, and what attracted you to researching it in the first place. Yeah, look, I do a lot of stuff, and um, one of my interests always been cryptozoology. With you know my brother with Bigfoot sightings near our farm mm -hmm. in upstate New York, um, and then I move on. Um, so I haven't done a lot in cryptozoology lately. Um, I, um, I did a book on, um, a couple of books on Bigfoot with my brother, Paul, mm -hmm. uh, did the champ book, um, did a book on haunted houses, um, famous cases of hauntings. Um, so that's my foray into books in the, um, cryptozoological and paranormal world. Um, it's a really interesting world where um, I'm very open to talking to people who believe that Bigfoot's out there, or there may be ghosts or things like this. Um, however, there's a lot of um, silliness that goes on as well. And um, I think it's important to call uh, a spade a spade. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I've just been through, I wrote a book on Havana syndrome. We've spent six and a half years wasting tens of millions of dollars um, chasing ghosts in Cuba. And mm -hmm. now five intelligence agencies, the CIA and the FBI have concluded that there never was a Havana syndrome. It was all wow. a myth. It was a catch-all category for a variety of illnesses, which is basically what I said in 2017 in a journal, a medical journal article. And then in the book I wrote with a neurologist uh, that came out a couple of years ago. And um, so yeah, I, I think it's, you know, this stuff is fascinating. It's interesting. Uh, if people want to explore it or research it or try to prove it, that's great. Uh, but unfortunately, in the field and having grown up with this stuff with my brother at a young age, we were exposed to, you know, UFOs, ghosts, Bigfoot, theories, you name it. We were, you know, right. involved in, in studying it and researching it. Um, but there are groups out there, particularly in the Bigfoot field, yeah. that they don't want to give up their Bigfoot hunting ground. They, uh, they want to be the first to prove that Bigfoot is real. Um, and as a result, you know, you get some groups having members sign declarations that they they won't uh, tell anyone where they're hunting and all this stuff, which, um, you know, I think is is really counterproductive. Mm. Um, and I don't look, I think it's fun. It's interesting. It's exciting. There's there's nothing wrong with searching for Bigfoot. I would encourage people to do it if that's what you're interested in. However, um, the, the evidence that there is uh, a Bigfoot out there is extremely scant. Mm. Um, throughout the entire history of the world, there's never been any uh, fossils, bodies, bones, or DNA evidence. People say, well, Gigantopithecus, that was, that was evidence of uh, uh, Bigfoot fossils. No, it's not. That was Gigantopithecus. And uh, that's not what people are seeing, mm -hmm. right? And um, so if Bigfoot is all over the place, you would expect to have some fossil remains and some bodies it's been seen in all of the 48 contiguous touching states in the United States. And if it's there with millions of armed people in the United States, uh, you, would have, you would have found the body. Um, you know, if it is there, you know, maybe it's some type of paranormal 
creature or something like that, mm. but it's not a flesh and blood creature. Uh, I don't subscribe to any of that. I subscribe to mainstream science, yeah. which is you've got honest, intelligent people who are credible people telling incredible stories. And they've always told incredible stories, whether it was fairies, um, chupacabras. Well, there's all types of stories and werewolves, you know, people seeing them in the past. And um, these are mostly, I don't believe, are hoaxes. But, you know, human beings are prone to seeing things that aren't there hearing things that aren't there and believing in things that, that never were. Um, in 1977, Rubio in Port Arthur, New Mexico, was cooking a tortilla on a skillet, and she burned it and thought she saw the face of Jesus. Uh -huh. um, and for the next many years, she had that under glass in her home. Thousands of people came to see it. Uh -huh. and. You know, the same thing with the face on Mars, right? Or yeah. the person in Florida who was grilling a, a grilled cheese sandwich. And um, I think it turned out to be the Virgin Mary or something, right? I uh, mean, people yeah. see what they want to see. There's a tendency for that because they want to believe so much. And um, yeah. I was just going to say that that's very interesting to me that you bring that up because my 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 university degree was in theology and once I, I grew up and I got married I got married to somebody from a different religion a similar religion to me but, but a different one it was very interesting to me when I entered into this cryptozoological field how much religiosity there was surrounding certain theories and ideas about uh, cryptozoological animals everybody seemed to have either a a philosophical slant or a, a religious um, under uh, undercurrent or ulterior motive improving their theory about these creatures and that seems to to be the reason oftentimes and that's why your book interested me that many researchers are apart from wanting the fame and the glory are battling each other online or uh, in the old days you know in these chat rooms it's because essentially somebody is questioning the the tenets of your religion and you're saying no 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 my way is right and and coming back with that well I mean what's your when you researched the book in Tom's story channel what was your your experience of that within the community that you were you were looking at at that point in in time just an observation I mean with with organized religion you have people getting together and giving testimony Mm. Right. I mean, and that's what some Bigfoot groups mm. are, aren't they? they? They get together, they reinforce their beliefs and they give testimony because at the end of the day, it's eyewitness testimony. It's not DNA evidence. Mm. And um, um, you and you often have blurry photos of somebody have a Christ-like image in the sky or in a cloud or something. Right. And you have these blurry photos of Bigfoot. Mm. And then when you get the really good photos of Bigfoot, you need to be really skeptical at the same time. Um, yeah, so I grew up um, on a farm in upstate New York on the um, along Lake Champlain, mm -hmm. uh, not too far from it, just a, a few miles. And um, what was fascinating to me was when I went to university, after we had investigated myself, Paul and myself, investigated cases, my professor at the State University of New York at Plattsburgh, uh, Philip Raines, um, he was the big uh, champ researcher at the time, along with Joe Zarzinski, who mm -hmm. was a teacher in um, Saratoga Springs, New York, at a school there. I believe he was a uh, social studies teacher. And so these were two of the main researchers on the history of champ. Joe wrote a book, and um, Phil Raines had studied it for uh, decades. And so I was in a unique position because I knew both of them. And, you know, they're both good people. Um, however, they didn't get along. Mm -hmm. And so I found that fascinating. And, you know, Joe's a good guy. But he also kind of gave into <clears throat> temptation, I think, with the Manzi photo. Because uh -huh. there are very, 
serious um, concerns about that photo, which um, degrade its credibility. But, Mm -hmm. you know, he wanted to believe so much that I think he looked the other way a little bit with that photo. But he's still a good guy and and, uh, a great role model. Um, and, And but people get carried away in these things. But Phil Raines, great guy. Um, Joe Zarzinski, great guy. Um, and I have a lot of tolerance for both of them. Mm-hmm. What I didn't have tolerance for, for some of these other researchers that were being interviewed on Discovery or History Channel uh-huh. and really giving non mainstream scientific perspectives there about Champ and claiming, you know, that uh, baby champ had been captured years ago and all this stuff, um, which I think really hurt the credibility of the more mainstream researchers in the area. Um, I think champ exists. Um, It's very unlikely. Um, And what's fascinating about that is you have, like uh, Loch Ness and other lake monsters, you have wave claims, waves of newspaper reports, media reports. They spike and then they disappear. And then you don't have a sighting for months on end. And that's evidence against the creature uh, existing because if it's a plesiosaur or a zugliodon, the primitive whale, the two most likely explanations that have been given by uh, researchers, then it has to come up for air. And you would have a more consistent uh, pattern of sightings, but you don't get that. And then, you know, the lake does uh, or has frozen over in the past as well. Um, And so there's a lot of questions about that. Where's body? Well, stuff like this. Anything. Oh, you've frozen there, Robert. Actually, um, seem to have lost the connection slightly. Let me just getting some heavy rain, just very temporarily, is just passing through over the next few minutes. Okay, oh, we're we're okay. back now. I think. Yeah, we are getting some uh, heavy rain here, uh, just for the ah. next few minutes. And then okay. it uh, should go away. Um, yeah. No problems. Carry on. I've, 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 um, I've, I've clicked to record again. That was fascinating, especially about the when the lake freezes over. And I hear all kinds of, um, I call them get out of jail free cards to explain the, the lack of sightings. So it would be things like perhaps the creature goes into a state of torpor, you know, similarly to a turtle or has a, uh, is able to, um, it has some form of cloacal respiration. That it uh, through a cloacal burst site, uh, like a turtle again, that it could utilize to stay submerged for long periods of time. And I think these, you know, they're plaus- plausibly, they're wonderful ideas, but we don't have anything scientifically to back that up in the fossil record. If it is a plesiosaur, you know, if it is a giant turtle or a zoodlodon or anything like that. And to me, that's, that's the struggle. So at Loch Ness at the moment, there's a, an Irish chap called Owen O'Fagan. And he watches the Nessie on the net webcam. There are eight webcams now, or nine, I think. And every few months, he watches it day and night. He reports a wave or a ripple from distance to the newspapers. They print it as a Nessie sighting. I think it's on something like 30 sightings. The official Loch Ness Register has stopped accepting his sightings. So everybody has stopped accepting them. And yet still, the newspapers are printing them. And I wonder as somebody that first, you know, followed the newspaper clippings and bits and pieces from a young age when I was interested in cryptozoology, how that is affecting the new up and coming cryptozoological researchers or enthusiasts and their opinion on the validity of something like Loch Ness. And, you know, do we have a similar phenomenon in Lake Champlain? I know that um, Dennis Hall, I think his name is, was reporting many strange stories for many years and he seems to have dropped off the map. Does this thing go in waves? You have one or two researchers suddenly uh, collectivize or uh, camp out at the lake 
and then all of the sightings explode, or at least the collection of stories and tales explode. And then inevitably, sooner or later, you know, the life wears them down and those sightings subside for a little while. Is that something that you've noticed in your research? Yeah, what you get is you want to look back at this from a distance. And what you get is usually the sighting waves are triggered by an initial sensational case. Uh -huh. And then what happens is people start scrutinizing their environment for evidence of what's been reported. And so you might nor normally look at the lake for 30 seconds or a minute, but if there's a wave going on, there's this initial media report, mm -hmm. now you're staring at the lake, you're scrutinizing it more than you ordinarily would. The same with UFOs. There's a thing before UFO waves, typically an initial sensational media report. Now, instead of just looking up and glancing at the sky for 30 seconds or so, mm. people are scrutinizing the sky and searching for evidence of extraterrestrial spacecraft. The same with Bigfoot. An initial sensational case often triggers a wave of sightings because people start over-scrutinizing their environment again. And they are prone to redefining a rustling in the bushes as a Bigfoot, a light in the night, a star planet or satellite as a flying saucer mm -hmm. or a wake or a wave from a boat or a log as a lake monster. And so I think there's a pattern to this that you can see over time and the media really stokes these outbreaks in that regard. Yeah, that, I mean, that would make sense to me uh, what about monster imposters in the lake so there was a, a a recent bit of alleged footage of champ in the lake I, I don't know what part of the lake it was based upon upon and towards the jetty you can see what looks like a large object swimming in a whale-like fashion below the surface and it got me to thinking is there you know are there any natural monster imposters that could enter the lake or that uh, reside in the lake that could be mistaken for champ. Sure, surgeon. I mean, that's the number one um, most likely candidate for uh, people who are seeing lake surgeon. And the other thing is, um, okay, it's unstable again. Sorry, um, sorry. Um, so the, the number one candidate is is lake sturgeon in terms of um, uh, people seeing things. And also you have to remember um, but in terms of these sightings, you know, you're, a lot of them are quite ambiguous, right? And then we're living in an age of deep fakes as well, yeah. where people can be motivated to uh, create some type of fake video. But the bottom line is uh, no fossils, no bones, uh, no DNA evidence. And so the most likely explanation for the Lake Champlain monster is that it is a, a human creation, a reflection of um, our hopes. You know, people want to believe it's there. It's exciting. Um, you know, and to become one of the part of one of the greatest mysteries in the world, all one has to do is go to the lake and look mm -hmm. long enough. And if you do, you'll see something that you can't identify. And maybe you've seen Champ. Um, so it is exciting and it's alluring. It's seductive. But um, at the end of the day, it, you know, it's the whole, it's, it's all very speculative. I mean, at Valley Forge with George Washington, what if he had an electric blender? You know, I mean, it's, it, there's <laughs> so much speculation out there and how it could, things. I mean, there's mm -hmm. just, and it becomes, um, some of the theories out there are really quite far out. I'm a straight down the line, mainstream scientist. Uh -huh. Can I prove that Champ doesn't exist? No, maybe it's out there, but it's highly unlikely given the lack of evidence. And if somebody can come up with tangible evidence that can be analyzed, great. I'd be more than happy to look at it, but but it's not there. 
but it's fun. It's interesting. I don't um, bemoan people that look at um, search for the Lake Champlain monster or other cryptids. It's fun. It's interesting. It's exciting. Go for it. Um, however, when you claim that it's real um, and there really is a creature out there without the evidence, then I just say, sorry, I, I need the evidence. And, and that's not, you know, and that's not a bad thing. I often wonder, Robert, if we were searching for other uh, more uh, better known creatures. So, for example, before the Okapi was discovered, you know, if we had employed, if, if there were a hundred different Okapi groups, when it was still, you know, a mythical creature, I suppose, or an unknown creature out there with all these different theories uh, ranging from it was paranormal or aliens put it there to, you know, it just freezes or hibernates at a certain part of the year or digs tunnels. We would think that was crazy, you know. Once we found this this um, flesh and blood animal that is just, you know, a normal part of the, the fauna of the world, we would think if we'd employed Bigfoot-like or, or Lake Monster-like research methods to discovering that animal or any of the recent discoveries that have been made. We think that was a crazy way to go about it and very unscientific. And yet with things like lake monsters, Bigfoot, or Mothman, uh, Dogman, whatever it is, you know, we accept all types of um, pseudo-scientific methodology. And uh, why do you think that is? Um, you know, I'm not sure. Um, what I'm wondering is, uh, so what time is it in the UK? It's 10.27. Uh, yep. Um, we're getting a thunderstorm here right now. I, you know, I checked the radar just beforehand. Uh, shouldn't last long. I'm just, I think it's finally stopped there. Okay. Uh, okay. Because uh, it was uh, just caused the picture to freeze there. Uh, um, yeah. So do you do you edit this or you just play the whole thing? I, I will. No, I'll edit this one. I'll edit it. I normally okay, no, okay. So but I mean we can no, we'll just keep yeah, yeah we'll just, just keep kind going of paste and, the nice um, bits and um and don't worry about that. Yeah. I mean, my my big thing is just follow the mainstream science. And um look, I have investigated Bigfoot reports, uh, ghost reports, all sorts of phenomena. It was fun, it was interesting, it's exciting. Um, but at the end of the day, I follow mainstream science, and uh, the evidence just isn't there at this point. And if somebody can come up with the evidence, great. But I think people sometimes want so much to believe, mm -hmm. they see what they want to see. What is it Carl Sagan said? Wherever we have strong emotions, mm -hmm. we are liable to fool ourselves. The other thing that comes to mind is the line from Shakespeare, A Midsummer Night's Dream. Or in the night, imagining some fear. Mm. How easy is a bush, supposed a bear? And, you know, there's, there's that temptation. Yeah. You know, like, like with ghosts, you know, people really want to believe in the existence yeah. of ghosts because it's potentially existence of life after death. And I see sightings of creatures like Bigfoot and the Lake Champlain monster as anti-scientific symbols in an increasingly secular age. So Farmer Joe down the road saw Bigfoot or saw the Lake Champlain mm -hmm. monster. Well, scientists say that that's not possible. But he saw it, and I've known him all my life, and seeing is believing. And so if the scientists got that wrong, maybe they got religion wrong as well. I do yeah. think religion does play a role here. Mm -hmm. Just like UFO sightings, UFOs are a substitute for God in a secular age where space aliens, science says it's, it's, it's plausible. Mm -hmm. um, well, if they were to visit Earth and share their technology, perhaps they could raise us to the immortal realm of the gods, right? Um, if you look at the alleged science fiction encounters and the alleged uh, real reports, aliens are often said to live hundreds of years or be immortal or cure disease. Um, so there's that quest for transcendence there. And you now, starting in the 1970s, 
right, with the books by people like Lauren Coleman and Jerome Clark, mm. Creatures of the Outer Edge, also known as Creatures of the Goblin Universe, right, the unidentified, mm -hmm. their books, they talked about these um, sightings of Bigfoot with UFOs, right? There's the famous Uniontown, Pennsylvania case in the 1970s that Bertold Schwartz, the psychiatrist, discussed in, in one of his books. Um, so there's been a number of reports of people seeing Bigfoot with, with UFOs, sometimes inside UFOs. That association raises the, the transcendent power there um, with, with space aliens. Um, and so, you know, I don't think that's a, a, a coincidence. I, th I, I would agree with that. Actually, very, that really brings up something to me that I, I found very curious. Lauren Coleman is actually a good... Is a good timestamp for the uh, accession uh, or ascendance of cryptozoology over these last few decades because he's been there the whole time and i wonder if younger people who've got into this genre and lauren just being one of many people that were foundational in some of the theories and concepts that people now believe as as script almost so perhaps lauren wrote something in his book about alligators in the sewers or um, werewolves possibly being giant, you know, unknown monkey species uh, somewhere around the world that were misidentified. And that's now a foundational concept that people have questioned, but base other theories upon. And it's very interesting yeah. to me that cryptozoology has grown in that way, not to slight Lauren, you know, he's given so much to the genre from an investigational point of view. But I always wonder, okay, now I'm looking at this um, theory that Lawrence come up with, or that one that Carl Schuker has come up with, or Hall has come up with, and I have to see them as theories, as concepts, as uh, points of view that they were investigating and putting forward as an option at that time, not as script, not as um, not as word, and that's it, it. Brings me back to the the point in cryptozoology that we're essentially in many respects looking at um, a lot of philosophies that are filling, fulfilling a God-shaped hole in Western society. In Western society, there's a God-shaped hole, so you have other interests that have a philosophical or religious feeling to them, especially in communities you mentioned before. In Eastern society, it's still in cryptozoology, or at least those unknown animals, they still represent the religious, you know, the supernatural animals that inhabit <laughs> the, the in-between world and I just wondered what your opinion was of that have you in your long experience been able to look back at these timestamps with different researchers over time and say yes that's when I saw cryptozoology take that turn and that's when I saw it take this new turn and yeah. all of the results. really interesting yeah. hmm. um you know if Bigfoot did not exist maybe it would be necessary to invent him or her hmm. right um What's fascinating is, I mean, look at a case, you've got different camps, right? Starting in the 1970s, mid 70s, you start to get the paranormal camp with Coleman and Clark's books and stuff like that. And you've got people that look at that today as more of a par paranormal mm -hmm. creature. Prior to then, it was more of a flesh and blood creature. You got your different camps out there. Um, if you go back and look at sightings like Ape Canyon, that's a really interesting case because if you look at the book that was written by the main recipient, he was talking about having all kinds of visions and paranormal phenomena mm. um, to the point where he really reflects uh, what's known as a fantasy prone personality. Mm. Um, and when you go back and you look at Bigfoot, Sasquatch in the Pacific Northwest, when you look at some of those legends, um, Bigfoot wasn't, Sasquatch wasn't a flesh and blood creature. It was a spiritual creature. And, um, and even if you look at some of the Northeastern U.S. Algonquin, Iroquois, Stone Giant um, mm. claims, I mean, some of these descriptions by the natives, the early descriptions were, I mean, huge creatures, 20, 30 feet tall. Mm. Um, so that doesn't mesh up with what people are are seeing today and the other interesting aspect is from the in the 1800s 
in the United States, 17, 1800s, the Bigfoot sightings were more wild men of the woods. Mm. They went feral. They had beards, right? And much more human-like. And then with the advent of the media and the 1900s, it became more monster-like, mm. right? And reflective. I mean, you go back and you look at that sighting, um, was it the Patterson book? Yeah. It almost looks like a Neanderthal on the cover, you know, that classic book, right? Uh, yeah. That doesn't look like Bigfoot today. Um, so the actual sightings of Bigfoot have changed over time. And if you go back into the Middle Ages in Europe, people had the wild man of the woods, right? Yeah. Or the forest. The same people came to the New World. They had those beliefs with them. And they saw very similar um, sightings, right? They, they had sightings of yeah. wild men. Of, of, of the woods, and that has gradually changed over time to the point where, um, just like a UFO landing report from the late 1890s is very different from a UFO landing report today. Same thing with Bigfoot sighting from that time period. It's very different from Bigfoot sightings of today. And I think that's fascinating to the point where I did a master's thesis on the history of UFO lore, comparing uh -huh. UFO lore with fairy lore. And what's fascinating to me is, mm -hmm. I think a case can be made that Bigfoot is essentially an overgrown fairy yeah. from a folkloric sense, because just like the fairies, you never caught them, right? And they always got away. They left fairy footprints sometimes in the sand and stuff like that. And the only difference is, it's just a different form. You know, it's not, um, you know, you got the black shuck as mm. a type of fairy dog in the UK, right? And these things, um, it's, just a, 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 it's just a bigger overgrown fairy um, because they never do find it. And uh, yeah. That, yeah. That's fascinating. Uh, when I was writing a, a recent book and I, um, I looked at little, little foot reports around the world and in my original book, Peace of Britain, I had a title, a chapter titled The Little People or the Hairy Fairy Folk. I was trying to extract, I suppose, these fairy stories from possible stories of diminutive upright primates. Like a little foot was very difficult and very successful. But what I discovered looking further is the Duende, for example, in South America. It's in, you know, it's in South America, it's in Central America, it's in Spain. And Portugal, well, why would it be in those, uh, you know, those, uh, the head of the colonies that inhabited these areas? And it's the same in North America. <clears throat> I mean, even the Pukwudgie and the Bookwist, in a way, their names are very similar to Puck, the Puck of you know, English and Welsh and Irish folklore. And I wonder, has there been a situation in the past where we've colonized or people have colonized certain countries, brought their folklore? Perhaps it's melded with the local folklore. And then 200 years later, it's fed back to the colonizers as a, a local fairy tale because it's become local, yeah. essentially. You know, like the pizza effect in the way, you know, America, the Italian pizza in America and Italians are now eating in Italy. Yeah. And I just wonder, is that what we're looking at with some of these things? You know, uh, almost uh, a resurgence of the, fo the folklore we brought to these countries now being fed back to us and we say well you know in the 1700s the local natives said x y and z because in the 1400s that's what we told them <laughs> what do you yeah think i mean that? you look at puerto rico with the chupacabra yeah and then that's spreading to the united states first mm -hmm. i think in florida and then in other areas we got a lot of spanish-speaking people mm -hmm. um i what i find interesting is there's a there's a guy in australia i think he's an anthropologist who has come up with this theory about Neanderthal, uh -huh. right, and Bigfoot. Um, and, you know, basically, unless um, in recent times you were in sub Saharan Africa, um, we pretty much all have Neanderthal DNA, you know, and so a small amount. And so his theory was okay, Neanderthal um, clearly interbred with Homo sapiens. There's no question about that. We can prove that now biologically um but it may not have been consensual and 
So there may be something in our evolutionary biology with our brain that um, when you're in a dark area um, or just in the woods or something where there could be some type of a predator mm -hmm. that we are prone to seeing um, large hairy ape-like creatures that resemble a Neander Neanderthal. Um, I just think it's, it was it was interesting. I mean, it could explain some sightings. Um, yeah, I think I think it's very it's it's, uh, it's very very plausible. Coming back to the 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 research is that the the dedication of of research sometimes. I just want to get your take on a few things. And one is the the need for content in an online sense. So I have a page with the cryptozoological sightings. I have books. I try to desperately resist this urge to post lots of content because of course within that is the vulnerability that you'll be faked and hoaxed and all the rest of it do you think that the desperation for content and evidence at the moment is leading some researchers to exaggerate their findings um you know i haven't followed the bigfoot field that closely in the last few years uh -huh. um after i finished the chant book and updated the uh the book with my brother on uh, Bigfoot in New York and New England, Documented Evidence Stranger Than Fiction, which was the follow-up book to Monsters of the North Woods. Yeah. And um, so I haven't followed it that closely, but I can say up until a few years ago, I mean, and I have seen online since, um, there are these groups out there, right, that seem quite exclusive often, and they don't want to share their information. And... You know, ideally, if some some scientists are not for the amateurs, so-called amateurs being involved in backyard scientists, go for it. I've got no problem with that whatsoever. But if you're if you're trying to prove the existence of a cryptid, what would be good is to have a journal, mm. have a publication that people can um, contribute to. Like in the past with UFOs, you had Flying Saucer Review, then you had the uh, NICAP uh, Journal, you had the International UFO Reporter, um, you had a, a number of uh, outlets there that people could uh, publish in. Um, for the cryptozoology world, you have the International Journal of Cryptozoology, I don't mm -hmm. think that's going anymore. But something like that, and there have been some other publications out there that weren't so broad. You had Pursuit, the Journal of Society for the Investigation of the Unexplained, which was founded by Ivan T. Sanderson, right? Mm -hmm. You've got um, all these different, uh, the, the Fortean, um, what was that, Fortean Journal? Um, uh, oh, uh, Fortean Times? No, that's the magazine. You've got the Fortean uh, Times to a certain yeah. extent. Right? Yeah, no, I think but, the Fortean Journal no longer exists. There's, there's a real dearth of publications mm -hmm. out there, like one really good publication that would cover cryptozoology or the paranormal world and other phenomena um, in, in a respectable way where people mm -hmm. can report their findings of investigations would be a contribution to, to mainstream science where this evidence could, could, be, could be looked at. But there is none. And I'd say that's unfortunate because you get, you've got literally hundreds of paranormal groups. You've got many dozens of Bigfoot groups, maybe hundreds around the world, uh, Bigfoot cryptozoological groups. And they're all doing their own thing. And occasionally there's a conference and mm -hmm. somebody will publish a book or something. I mean, what you really need are people to go out and do investigations and subject those to uh, the scrutiny of mainstream scientists. Exactly. And, but you don't have that at present. And that's that's unfortunate. Exactly. And I, I think that is interesting to me. And I wonder if it was like this, you know, still at the time of Sanderson and, and Hoover when all these people, this seems to at least be more of a, a camaraderie or, or a, a colleagueship within the community. And at least that people felt they should offer up their evidence for peer review of some kind. And I think that's really what you're talking about, isn't it? Let's invite mainstream science to examine the alleged evidence that exists for these creatures. Even if it's, you know, uh, a thousand 
disparate individuals reporting one creature in different parts of the world. There's something that can be gleaned from that in those reports. I I think it does a disservice when you get groups and you have members signing things saying that they they won't release Mm -hmm. information about where they're hunting for Bigfoot or this or that and the other thing. I just think it's counterproductive Mm -hmm. and kind of silly. Um, and but it's that whole notion where why would you do that? Because you want to be the one to find Bigfoot, right? Yeah. And um, to get the credit. And I mean, it, it's counterproductive in the long run. And um, people should just be um, open and sharing. And but it doesn't happen. And you get these feuds going on, particularly sorted with the Bigfoot community, right? Mm. You had the uh, there's a famous article called the Bigfoot Follies, right? where um, I think there was, uh, was it Peter Byrne or one of the Bigfoot researchers uh-huh, yeah. uh, almost got into a fist fight at a McDonald's or something. And uh, right, it's, um, it's unfortunate and it doesn't advance what people are trying to promote. I mean, I, people ask me, do you believe in Bigfoot? It's not a question of belief. It's a question of evidence. Mm-hmm. The evidence simply isn't there. I'm willing to believe if you can show me the evidence. And it's not there. And the evidence is you got all this eyewitness testimony. People claim to see Bigfoot. Well, people, thousands of people used to claim to see fairies. Where are the fairies now? Mm. There were thousands of people up until relatively recently claimed to see giant sea serpents on the ocean, right? Where did all the sea serpent sightings go? And so, you know, you've got the fallibility of human perception and mm-hmm. memory reconstruction. There's all kinds of potential explanations there for what people were seeing and why. And so I'm very sympathetic to anybody in any group that wants to go out and investigate mm-hmm. Bigfoot. And I say, go ahead and do it. However, um, I would say share your findings. And, you know, it's, um, it's no big secret I mean, we're here to to explore, to Mm -hmm. help one another and to advance um, belief. And some of these some of these groups and some of these members get really upset with scientists say, oh, they're they're putting us down and stuff like that. Well, behave like a scientist in a mature manner and present the evidence. Right. Give us the evidence. Where did you go? Where did you don't keep it a secret? Where did you look? What what did you find? And let's examine that evidence in, um, in a scientific manner. But unfortunately, that's not the norm. And um, yeah. What kind of rebuttals do you find that are most common amongst uh, philosophical, let's call it, researchers who don't want to share their alleged evidence with scientists? What well, are the most common rebuttals that you've heard before? One of the ones I've heard a lot is, oh, well, you know, the government is covering these things up because of the logging industry in regards to Bigfoot. And if we give them the evidence, they're just going to, you know, they're just going to black bag it and we'll never see it again. And, and which I find really strange because I, especially in this this new climate of uh, hyper environmentalism where everybody's very concerned, even from a governmental point of view, in at least appearing to protect environments and habitats, it would seem like a boon, actually, to governments to me to, to have a creature that now needed protecting and all of this logging here, there and everywhere could no longer be done or, you know, the environmental uh, philosophies could could settle and say, well, look, here you go. We found uh, an unknown ape in North America that we never knew was there. We've really got to behave now and treat the environment a bit better, like we've been telling you. What, what rebuttals do you find the most common in your experience with researchers? Well, look, I can go out and unfortunately, social media drives this, right? Mm-hmm. If I am a white supremacist, I can go out and on the internet and I'll find white supremacy sites and I can go to meetings. And I can go to online meetings. I can make white supremacist friends. With Bigfoot, it's similar, right? Because social mm-hmm. media algorithms drive this stuff right and it drives conflict as well Mm. so i can hang out with bigfoot people i can just read bigfoot material and you get a a distorted view of the world through these lenses that yeah bigfoot's out there it it, you know it's definitely there um and 
So these people you're talking about, I think they're not dealing with reality. They're not mm -hmm. dealing with mainstream science and they've gone down a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. And for the last several hundred years since the advent of science, scientists have looked at that rabbit hole and they thoroughly examined it thus far. And all they found are rabbits, not giant <laughs> crypto rabbits, but just normal rabbits, right? And so it's that prosaic, mundane explanations mm. can account for these things and that there's a government cover up and stuff like that. I mean, these people need to get a grip on reality. Governments are um, so inept anyway that they could cover anything up is beyond me, really. I think it's... Um, yeah. Yeah, we anyway. There's a there's a whole government co gov uh, government cover conspiracy here about the big cats in the UK, and I said that it's not that they're covering up; they're just not doing their job. Defra, that's the agency. Here. They're just not really investigating. They're like, okay, big cat sighting. Are you going to send anybody out? No, I don't think so. We'll leave that. Leave that to the newspapers. There's no cover up. It's just lack of interest. And I think yeah. that's you know that's the main thing. Now you mentioned the. Um, and that really made me laugh, you know, unfortunately, all you find in a rabbit hole are, are rabbits. Uh, there's a new phenomenon, new-ish of stick formations in the Bigfooting community. You must have seen it. Sticks in X's and, you know, yeah. the stick wheels and little glyphs and all the rest of the stuff. And here in the UK, well, there is a, uh, a Bigfoot phenomenon of, of sorts, at least in reports. Every single site is full of these sticks and stones. And one day I just asked, a, you know, a very simple question. I said, OK, were there any footprints near the stick structure? Apparently this is a big, tall, heavy creature. Were there any hairs stuck on the sticks? Oh, no, no, that's it. Nothing at all. If I stood there at, you know, 90 kilos and built those, those stick structures, there would be evidence of me. So why yeah. do people not see this? And like what I commented was, you know, unfortunately, um, the woods are full of sticks. You know, if you yeah. go looking for sticks in the woods, you're going to find sticks. That's kind of um, where and, and we what, are. What, what, what's, what's happened more recently is this thing with the knocks, right? With like that oh, yeah. TV yeah. show Finding Bigfoot, right? Mm. They do a Bigfoot knock and then they hear a knock back or something like that, right? Mm. I mean, um, I just Googled um, creatures like that can make knocking sounds in the woods and there's there's all sorts of birds mm. and other things that can make these sounds, uh, and humans can as well. Um, so that's Bigfoot communicating. I mean, I just I'm just not buying it. Um, that that TV show Finding Bigfoot epitomizes this, right? I mean, I think they're honest, sincere people. We've met uh, some of them before. Hey, um, they're lovely guys. Yeah. In, 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 interviewed my my brother there for one of the shows. Um, good, honest, sincere people, but they never quite find it. Right. And um, there's just enough to keep you going, but not quite enough. Yeah. And it's a valuable program because you do get the sense of how broad this phenomena is. And you do get to hear from some local witnesses. Mm. So that's valuable. But um, no, they do never find the body, unfortunately. Well, I was thinking and, about that. It's past progressive, right? It's finding Bigfoot, not found. And um I guess that's the, at least the hope is that, I loved that show, and I, I do, I know Cliff and Bob Wilber, but I love that show from the perspective of, I mean, you know, TV is TV, and it's not the same as doing science, we've got to accept that, it has to be interesting, but it was very nice from the perspective of four sort of different personalities, genuinely wanting to find something, I think what it invoked actually was a spirit of exploration, which people yeah. are very desperate to have, you know, the old Percy Fawcett's uh, books and all these other things from the 19th and 20th centuries. It was all about that, going to somewhere that hasn't been investigated before and finding something or hearing tall tales and bringing them home to tell people around the campfire. I love that. Um, one final question before we go, and that was, I was very interested, especially because of the book, in Tall Story of Champ, in, in your thoughts on what happens to researchers that dedicate their whole daily lives to the pursuit of of finding a specific creature you know they go and they live at lake champlain forever or they move to loch ness for 25 years or you know they they, they move into a log cabin in a wood where they're supposed to be bigfoots and every day is that 
in my um, experience, a lot of those people, you know, it's it's they're creating a recipe for a ruined life in a way. What types of um, what examples of of this have you seen during your career about these people that, that dive in deep to one cryptid and give their whole lives to it? What's the outcome? Well, I mean, first of all, more power to them if that's what you love to do. And maybe you have a partner that loves to do that as well. Great. Um, so I've got no problem with that. But it's important to keep your objectivity. Because when you are so focused on that day after day after day after year, you can easily slip down that narrow view of the world in that rabbit hole hmm. where the world is just, it's a Bigfoot world or it's a champ world or it's an ET world. And you're not dealing with reality because most people don't believe in Bigfoot. What is it? Roughly 10, 15% of the population in America, something like that, mm -hmm. uh, believe in the uh, existence of Bigfoot. Most people don't. But if you're in that world, you can, especially if you're alone a lot, mm. you can have a distorted view of reality. And yeah. then you could be vulnerable to all sorts of things, you know, QAnon and all this other stuff. So, um, you know, that that's a concern. And um, yeah. No, I, 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 I heartily agree with you. I was speaking to... Uh, I don't know if he was a friend of yours, a friend of mine, a good friend of Paul's, I know, uh, may he rest in peace, uh, Scott Mardis, um, just two years, three years ago. And we did a little interview about work-life balance. He had dedicated his life to Lake Champlain. He'd lived there at some point. And further on, he moved with his wife to Florida and, and returned to the lake once a year. And he said, I don't do this all the time. You have to have a work-life balance, which to me was very surprising because at that point I saw Scott as a, a died in the world, nine to five, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, lake monster hunter. And I thought, yeah, at that time I was fully into it, day and night, day and night. I have a family, I have a job. And I thought, okay, yeah, this is, this is really important. You know, these things, as you mentioned before, they are fun. They should be enjoyable, I suppose, at a certain point. When that stops being with, fun, you have to step back and take a break. With Scott Martis, I think it waxed and waned. You uh -huh. know, there were periods where there was an intense interest and it would wane a bit and then mm -hmm. it would come back again. Uh, what a nice guy, mm -hmm. very articulate, very scientific, yeah. very knowledgeable, very logical, and just a, a nice human being. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the issue I have, and I have to mention it before we leave, and that is, you know, we're talking about uh, the TV show Finding Bigfoot, oh, yeah. that show Mountain Monsters. I don't know if you get that oh. in the UK. I mean, oh my God. I can't watch it. No. Yeah. Well, I mean, if I'm looking for cheap entertainment, I'll watch it. But I mean, it's so clearly staged. Yeah. That, yeah. And, and I think that does a disservice to, yeah. um, to the field. And it really makes them out to be silly. And, Is it on and history that's or discovery? Which tell on it on? Um, it's not, it's not a it's, channel I, I didn't expect it would be on. I think it's Discovery. Discovery, I'm pretty okay. Sure. I think it was Animal Planet or something like that. Mm. I'm not exactly sure, but it's called Mountain Monsters. Yeah, I've seen it's a few hillbillies. Episodes. Basically, it's a hillbilly Bigfoot investigation yeah. group, and uh, they really make them out to look like hillbillies and rednecks. And I just yeah. think it's it's not a good look for the field. Um, but so be it. It's, I mean, it's pop culture and entertainment, and uh, I watched a few episodes, I was laughing most of the time, and my impression was that that's how you were supposed to take it, in a way. Yeah. I'm not sure, I mean, who knows, for people with no idea, I mean, there was one called Beaver Man, one episode, uh, I think I saw that in another one, and I was like, okay, you know, this is clearly a fun spoof of any kind. I don't feel yeah. that they're trying to tell me what they're doing is genuine. Yeah. So from that perspective, yeah, yeah, I yeah. guess I just kind of tick it on the chin. And there's been many things. Finding Bigfoot is a middle ground. And even the guys who were in it, you know, always confess that they would like to have been a lot more scientific and not just walking around in the woods with, you know, a Ghostbusters backpack, get up with a little camera light in your face, clearly not finding anything as you shine 
you know, with your big camera crew and your your unit with the cafe in the middle of the North Woods somewhere. <laughs> you know, it's um it, you're not gonna find anything that way. But it, you know, it's, it's like the it's the WWE version, yeah. right? Of uh, cryptozoology, and you just have to take it for what it is. Yeah. And it is entertaining. It is interesting, and they do yeah. cover real mysteries in a sense. Yeah. But um, it's really, um, it's it's a sketch. I mean, it's really funny to watch. It's um, hard. But yeah. I mean, there are people out there that are probably watching it and thinking, "Oh, wow, you know, maybe they're going to catch it this time." But to always manage to just get away. Yeah. Well, I wondered about this, and then you know, very recently we were pitching a, uh, an international sort of cryptid travel show as well. And and one of the things I said in the pitch was, look, you know, we're very unlikely to find anything of any interest at all, evidentially. This show has to be picturesque. It has to be beautiful. It has to look amazing. It has to be history and storytelling and background because we're not probably going to find a thing. And that's what the audience will be disappointed by. So make it a wonderful thing to watch, a beautiful thing to look at. You know, like being told a story around the campfire all the time, whilst looking at beautiful scenery in places you've never visited. That's the pitch. And uh, they were like, yeah, okay, that sounds really good. They didn't buy it, but they, they, they liked the idea. And I just thought maybe that's the point. You know, essentially, if you're watching these things on TV, you more or less guarantee that there's no evidence involved. Otherwise... Yeah. The title would be Shocking New Discovery X, Y, and Z, and that's how you proceed. Um, anyway, I'm waxing on. Uh, Robert, before we go, just tell people you know, where they can buy your books, how they can find you if they want to contact you and, and uh, you know, ask a question or, or, or a sighting or an encounter. Uh, how should they do that? I have a website, uh, reberthalmew.com. If you just type in Robert E. Berthalmew, you'll, you'll, you'll get my website. Um, and the book would be on Amazon, uh, the, uh, on the history of the Lake Champlain monster. Mm -hmm. Um, and look, I did it because I just, I grew up with it and I thought it was interesting and I wanted to make a contribution to the literature. I don't take myself too seriously. Um, and I just think I, I'm in this area and I'm still interested in cryptozoology because it's fun. It's mm. exciting. It's interesting. And nothing beats getting a call at uh, 11 o'clock at night and somebody claims to see a Bigfoot, you know, near your farm or something like that. And you're out there and um, it's, it's exciting. That's yeah. why I do it. I agree. And I'm very open to uh, other people uh, investigating this stuff. Go for it. But um, just kind of keep your feet on the ground. and. Uh, a good sense of uh, of reality out there. And what is it uh, someone once said, all things are to be investigated and called into question. So there's nothing wrong with investigating this stuff. And uh, I, for anybody out there um, who um, would be critical of myself for being a skeptic, well, I mean, I just, I'd like to believe, show me, give me the evidence and I'll believe, but I need to see the evidence first. 